So Jesus is now heading to Jerusalem with many others who have been following him. Uh, some of them have just been listening to his teaching. Some of them have been healed by him and they're following after. Remember, it was just a couple of days earlier that blind Bartimaeus was healed by Jesus and he followed Jesus after he was healed. There were some lepers that were healed, 10 of them. Nine of them were nowhere to be found, but one of them followed and believed in Jesus and he followed him. He told the apostles that he was going to be killed, that he was going to be harassed, scourged, beaten, ridiculed, and then he was going to die on the cross. But on the third day, he would rise again. He told them that three times. They still didn't quite grasp what was happening. Today's message is titled, The King is Coming. We're going to begin in John chapter 11 today as we start this uh, message. John chapter 11, we're going to uh, pick it up in verse 55. And we'll be jumping around uh, to a few different places today. I was talking with someone uh, from the Billy Graham Association who is going to be putting on the event next year here at the Fountain. And uh, we were talking at the community center on Tuesday. And he said, um, I loved going to Calvary Chapel. And when I was there, because he was there in the 60s when Pastor Chuck was you know, just starting out. He still had the tent and everything set up uh, in, in Costa Mesa. And he said, what I loved about going to Calvary Chapel is when Pastor Chuck said, turn to this page, you would hear all of the pages in the Bible turning. People were reading their Bibles. And they, he said, it sounded like a bunch of locusts just flew through the place. And, and so, it, uh, so it was pretty cool. We, we talked to a lot of different people at the event, um, at, you know, getting ready for uh, next year. And it was just neat because some of them were actually Calvary Chapel pastors. And, and uh, you know, to hear... Uh, what God is doing. It's not about Billy Graham Association. It's about Jesus Christ. Yeah. And, you know, so we're looking to show people who Jesus is, to make them aware of a relationship with Jesus. And, and so that's why I'm all in for this. I want to get as many people saved as possible. And, and that's what our relationship is all about. It's, it's not about, you know, hiding what we have because there's only so much of it to go around. No, we're, we're, we're sh sharing it with everybody. And the more we share, the more we receive. The more God blesses us in what we're doing and he'll bring even more people our way. So here, they are all gathered in the Kidron Valley. I can only imagine there was some people that were there in the Kidron Valley that were zealots. They were people that were all in for Israel and uh, they wanted to see the enemy Romans kicked out of Israel and, and then the king placed on his throne in Israel. That's what they were thinking was actually taking place. They were lining that valley, cheering on Jesus as he comes. I bet, I don't bet, I, I, I gave that up. Uh, if you hear me going up into Vegas and stuff like that, it's about my uncle. It's not about <laughs> Vegas. I didn't, no slots, no nothing. Anyway, um, you know, 
I believe that there were some that were in the audience that day that were ready to give their lives uh, for the victory over the enemy. And so when you have that mindset, when you realize that the people that were gathered there weren't all on the same page, they didn't all understand what was actually taking place. As a matter of fact, very few of them did understand what was taking place during those moments as Jesus came through the Kidron Valley. And so in John chapter 11, in verse 55, we read, And the Passover of the Jews was near, and many went, up, went from the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. And they sought Jesus and spoke among themselves as they stood in the temple. What do you think? That he will not come to the feast? And now both the chief priests and the Pharisees Pharisees had given a command that if anyone knew where he was, that he should report it, that they might seize him. And and so that's the scenario. That's what's going on in the Temple Mount, in, in the group of people that are gathered. They're coming from all over the place. And Derek uh, shared with me that he had heard there was up to 250, uh, 250,000, right? Um, lambs that were then sacrificed during Passover. Okay, Josephus wrote about that. And so 250,000, that's just the people that could afford lambs because many people could not afford something, uh, you know, as exorbitant as a lamb. They, they could afford doves. And that's what they would sacrifice. And remember on the Temple Mount, they would sell doves so that people could have something to sacrifice. Of course, they were selling it much more than what it was worth. Um, They would take whatever they brought. Oh, you brought a dove? Sorry, that one doesn't qualify. Uh, You have to buy one of ours. And so it it was really a sad state of affairs um, going in because these people were truly going uh, to worship God. They wanted to sacrifice so that they would uh, be deemed cleansed, deemed forgiven, so that they could um, partake in the feast. They wanted to be able to uh, celebrate. So in verse 12, I mean, excuse me, chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. And remember, Lazarus had sisters Martha and Mary, and they lived together, and that's where Jesus was. And they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. And then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the oil was filled, uh, excuse me, the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. And so can you picture that? They're, they're all gathered around the table and Jesus is there and with his feet out onto the side and Mary comes and pours all of this oil. And I, and I don't think it's uh, stinky oil. I think it's actually very fragrant and, and very high. See, she wouldn't have poured cheap oil on his feet. This was something, oil of spikenard was very expensive. Probably the amount that she poured on his feet was worth a year's salary. And so here she's pouring it on his feet and wiping it with her hair. Uh, I know that women, they, you know, do you do that with your husband at night? Oh, here, let me get, let me clean your feet for you. Uh, that, that's not something I would think of, but... There it was. Mary thought of that and and thought, this is how much I love this man. This is how much he should be honored in doing that. And uh, and she wiped uh, the oil off. And can you imagine the smell? It it says um, that the 
house was filled with the fragrance of his oil. And it was a fra- it was a good thing. Cheryl and I had dinner at the keg uh, a few weeks ago, and someone came in wearing perfume. That was not a good thing. <laughs> and they had too much of it on. It ruined my meal, you know. And I don't have a sense of smell. I can taste it. That's how bad it was. And, and then they sat in the booth right behind me. And, and so, uh, so it isn't that kind of fragrance. This was a pleasing fragrance all through the house. And uh, oil is indicative of the Holy Spirit also. And, and I, you know, I just get that feeling of how the presence of God was there in that place. And, and ministering to the people that were there. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. And he had the money box, and he used, he used to take what was put into it. And so we're just finding out that Judas Iscariot was a thief. You know, we always knew he was going to betray Jesus, you know, but here we found out that he's a thief. And it was like the Holy Spirit held back that information until now that it's, it's put in the scripture. And so you mean the rest of the guys didn't know that? Why wasn't Andrew keeping, you know, the, the tithe box? You know, why? But be, and do you think Jesus didn't know? You see, he knew. And even though he had a thief stealing the money, there was always enough for everyone there. There was always enough to go around because he was in charge. Judas thought he was, you know, getting you know, something by them, but he wasn't getting anything by Jesus. And so he was a thief too, besides a betrayer. And Jesus said to him, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. And Jesus was basically saying, you know what, you're just making a story up here to get your hands on that money and just give it up. She has been saving this for the day of my burial. And and she was honoring him because she knew what was coming. And she was honoring Jesus and getting him ready. And, And... you know, I don't know that she knew how long it was going to be or anything like that. I don't think Jesus gave her any indication, but she knew in her heart. See, this is the work of the Holy Spirit before the Holy Spirit was living inside of everyone. Remember, the Holy Spirit didn't come until after Jesus rose from the dead. Remember, I need to go to my Father so that the Comforter may come and dwell in you. And so Jesus... Um, was present, but the Holy Spirit also still had a presence with uh, the believers there. And so Jesus told Judas, hey, back off. And Mary was doing something that was good. Nobody questioned Jesus about what he meant either. You ever notice that? The longer he was in ministry, they stopped asking what he meant because it was like we've been following you for three and a half years we have no clue so we figured you'll tell us if it was important otherwise we're, we're not going to ask any more questions it just makes us look dumb how many times did Peter say things that just made him look so stupid you know and and I know that would be me you know the only time I take my foot out of my mouth is to get the other one in Be assured um, Jesus knew that he was a thief and that Jesus knew it was going to go up. We're going to be uh, turning now to Luke chapter 19. Turn back a little bit to Luke 19. And Luke now tells a little bit more of a, a different part of the story. Luke 19. 
and we'll be in uh, picking it up in verse 29. So here they were, they were in Bethany, that's where they st- spent the night in Bethany with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and others that were there. Uh, you know, the disciples, the apostles were always there. And so here they leave there, and now they're going to head into Jerusalem. And uh, so we pick it up in verse 29. And it came to pass when he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mountain called Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village opposite you, where as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you loosing it? Thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. And so those who were sent went their way and found it just as he said to them. But as they were loosing the colt, the owners of it said to them, why are you loosening the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of him. And and so it was just like Jesus said was going to happen. And there they go. So who are the owners of the colt? We don't know. We're never given any further information. I believe that they had a vision. They knew that someone was going to come and ask for the cult. And, you know, the secret password is the Lord has need of him. And, and, and so they were told that's what was going to be said. If someone would have come up and said, well, I just like it and I'm taking it, uh, they would have beat them up. But instead, it was the Lord has need of it. And they said, that was my dream. You know, now, now I know that this is supposed to be. I would only have to imagine that they went with them as they brought the cult to Jesus. And so um, they, uh, those who were set, they, they brought it um, and they got it. The Lord has need of them. And then in verse 35, they brought him to Jesus and they threw their own clothes on the cult and they sat Jesus on him. And when you consider that, it's a miracle. Because the colt had never been sat on before. This was a wild animal, never been trained, never been sat on. And it just gives us another demonstration of the power of Jesus. He is able to bring calm to a wild animal when he is put on the back of the animal. And so uh, they put Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. So here's the Kidron Valley. And like I said, it's just a valley that goes up, goes down like this, goes up on the other side. Standing on it today, standing on the Mount of Olives, you can look across and you can see uh, the eastern wall. You can see the east gate. It's sealed. Okay, they, they sealed it. The, the Muslims have sealed that because it's going to stop the Messiah from entering through the east gate. You know, bricks can stop God. So that's why they sealed it. You know what else they did? They planted a cemetery in front of the wall. You see, because Jews wouldn't be allowed, it would disqualify them. It it would make them dirty and disqualified from being able to even enter into the Temple Mount. Uh, they, they would have to be go through a, a ceremonial cleansing before they got onto the Temple Mount. And so they planted this whole um, cemetery right there in front of the wall. So there's no way that the Messiah will be able to come and, and go through the wall. It's still, you can see pictures of it. It's still there. It's, it, if you're on the Temple Mount, you can see where it... Um, it goes down to the east gate. Uh, it, it's sealed from the other side. You know, you can see that there is this opening. So that's where the original 
Temple Mount, the gate, the original access was onto the Temple Mount. Remember, they built things in layers there. So uh, this was layers lower. Herod's temple, when he rebuilt everything, he added to everything, making new layers uh, above the old Temple Mount, the original Temple Mount. And, and so, but the wall's still there. And so Jesus is now going to ride through the Kidron Valley, come up the other side, and enter into the east gate. And so the people there were putting their clothes on the ground, or palm fronds, we read in another gospel, on the ground laying out so that the hooves of the donkey don't even touch the dirt. Well, this was a way to honor a king riding into town. When a king um, overthrew the enemy and took possession of a city, they would ride in on a white stallion showing that they were the conqueror. They came in as the conqueror. But if a king wanted to come in and demonstrate peace to the people in that city, they would ride in on a donkey. And so here they were putting the clothing and the palm fronds down, and he was riding on a donkey, bringing peace to the city. He was coming in not as a conquering king, but he was coming in as a king nevertheless, but he was coming in peace the owners of that donkey may have known what Zechariah 9.9 9 said. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. And so maybe that's why they knew. Maybe all the people were aware, but I don't think so. I'll tell you why. Because the Pharisees and scribes and Sadducees weren't teaching that. They weren't teaching that Jesus was going to be persecuted. They weren't teaching that he was coming on it. They were teaching that he was coming to conquer all their enemies and wipe everyone out. The Pharisees have been getting it wrong for thousands of years. And that's why they didn't recognize Jesus when he showed up on the scene. Verse 37. Then as he was now drawing near them, descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. And so the Pharisees once again didn't get it, but the people believed that Jesus was coming to conquer. He was coming to win a battle with the Romans pushed them out and then he would bring peace and prosperity to the entire city. That's what they thought were going to happen because they didn't know the scriptures. And because the Pharisees weren't teaching them the scriptures about what Isaiah said. Now they had the book of Isaiah. They knew completely what Isaiah had wrote. They had Psalm 22. Psalm 22 is a psalm that describes in detail the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. They had all that. But the Pharisees weren't teaching this is what is going to take place. 
These are the things that we're going to expect to see when the Messiah arrives on the scene. Isaiah 53 says that Jesus would be despised and rejected by men. And we know that Isaiah 53 prophecy is about the Messiah because Jesus even spoke about it in Luke chapter 22, verse 37. He said, For I say to you that this which is written must still be accomplished in me. He's saying, This is what was written about me, and it still has to be done. And he was numbered with the transgressors. For the thing concerning me have an end. And so what he was saying in Isaiah 53, 12, he was saying that he was going to be numbered with the transgressors, the two thieves that were at his side. So he was then crucified with two thieves. He was going to be numbered with the transgressors at the time of his death. Isaiah 53 spelled that out perfectly and Jesus said, that's me it's talking about. It's going to happen. But the things concerning me have an end. You see, he was going to die. There was going to be an end to those things concerning him. He was going to be wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, and he was going to be numbered with those transgressors. We should recognize, we do recognize, in hindsight, because we have all the scriptures, Old and New Testament, we can look back and say, obviously, this was the Messiah. There are people today that have the same Bible we do, but they don't recognize that. They make up stories about what the Bible says. They allegorize it. And it then takes scripture inspired by the Holy Spirit, helping us to understand what God wants us to know. They take that and make stories out of it. It becomes fairy tales. It becomes what they wanted to say, not what the Holy Spirit wants the word to say. And so I don't know who you trust, but I'm not going to trust a pastor who makes things up and tells me stories about the scripture. I'm going to trust the scriptures themselves. And that's why here we stay focused on the word. We want to know what God says through his word even if we don't like it. Have you ever read a scripture that just made you uncomfortable? <laughs> every day! Every day! I, I, I read and say, couldn't you have said that differently? Come on, Paul. Man, you're so harsh. You know, if we don't read the scriptures the way that the Holy Spirit inspired them and meant them, Uh, then we miss the whole purpose of the Bible. And then we miss who Jesus is. And that's the most important thing for us to recognize. Who is Jesus? We have to define, we have to declare in our heart who Jesus is. If we don't recognize Jesus for who he is and, and for the purpose that he came to earth, that he died on the cross, if we don't recognize that, then we can go to any religion and be satisfied. And that's why so many people do go to other religions. Even though they don't have anything supporting what they believe, they don't have any document. Oh, they have plenty of documents, but none of them are valid. And they can't prove anything. Do you know, even Islam does not believe that you automatically go to heaven if you're a Muslim. They still don't believe. They don't know. They just hope. Man, I hope I make it. I don't know. And there is no hope outside of Jesus Christ. It's the only religion where we have a relationship with the creator of the universe. Christianity and that's but unfortunately that word is so watered down now 
There are so many people that call themselves Christians, but they don't believe the Bible. And that's really the problem here. That's how come they got it all wrong. That's how come they thought that, you know, Jesus was going to come and conquer and he was going to set up his kingdom because they didn't know. They didn't read the scriptures and believe what the scriptures told them. Things haven't changed much, have they? There are many churches that believe that Christians, the Christian church has replaced Israel. And that, you know, Israel no longer are the children of God. Now it's the church. It's called replacement theology and it's evil. It, it leads people in the wrong direction. Uh, the reason why I say that is Romans chapter 11 tells us specifically that the children of Israel are going to get another shot. They're going to be able to redeem themselves in the future. It's going to happen. We, we are told how it's going to happen. Unfortunately, two-thirds of the Jews are going to be killed during the tribulation period. One-third are going to be saved, and that's during Revelation, uh, Romans chapter 11. We read about how they will be saved and, and then um, how the future plays out for them. But if we're not reading the scriptures, if we don't understand the scriptures, then all of this just goes over our head. It's not... Uh, something that we understand clearly. That's why we need the Holy Spirit so that we can understand these things. In verse 41, Now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. And so there's Jesus just spelling it out. He was telling them what was going to happen in 70 AD. The destruction of the temple, the destruction of the city. He's saying not one stone will be left upon another. That's exactly what happened when they came. And they didn't mean to burn down the temple, by the way. It, it was an accident. Uh, when Titus went in, he didn't want to burn it down. He just wanted to take possession of it. Un unfortunately, it did get burnt down. And when it did, the heat from the fire melted all of the gold. And so it was all in between the stones. And so they had to remove all the stones one at a time to get all the gold out from in between the stones. And they tossed the stones into the Kidron Valley. And you can see them today piles of stones in the Kidron Valley that were used for the temple. And so that they can get, so Jesus said it twice, that not one stone will be left upon another. And, and there it was. We can see it today, the evidence that Jesus knew what he was talking about. He didn't make it happen. Jesus wasn't out there pushing stones over the side. He had risen from the dead. It was years later before the temple was destroyed. And Jesus wept. It, it wasn't a kind of weeping like when you're watching a Hallmark movie. This was weeping, just, just uncontrollable sobbing and weeping as he wept for the city. They didn't know what was coming. They didn't know who was already there. Jesus said these things were hidden from their eyes. He wasn't saying he hid them from their eyes. He was just saying they weren't aware of these things. And there are many people today that watch the news and the truth is hidden from their eyes. Even though they're watching the news, they're hearing things that 
feed them information. The truth is not what they're hearing. They're only hearing what they want to hear or what they're being told. And the truth isn't being revealed. And I don't care which news station you listen to or watch, they're all like that. They have an agenda about what they're providing the news for. They want you to hear what they are preaching. Uh, it's a religion in and of itself. Paul speaks about mysteries, just like this was a mystery. Paul speaks about mysteries in 1 Corinthians 2.7. He says, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for, they ha for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. That's from Isaiah 2. That's Isaiah 64, 4. For, but God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. So Paul says through the Holy Spirit, we can no, they're not hidden from us. We don't have to walk through life clueless because God wants to reveal the things that we should know, the things that will help us to live for him. Because I know I've tried on my own trying to live for God. Have any of you done that? Come on, fess up. I know you have. All of us have where we try to do something while well, I'm doing this for God. And, and we just get frustrated. Why? Why can't I, you know, be successful? I'm doing it for you, Lord. You know, why, why isn't this working? And because we're doing it in our own power. And God wants us to allow the Holy Spirit to work through us, in us, and through us. And so when he does the work, uh, his burden is light. It's easy. And Paul tells us that we can know these things. Jesus confirms that in Luke eleven thirteen 13, when he says, if you then being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. First of all, doesn't that just tap your hide? What Jesus just said, you being evil. That's to us too. You being evil. I'm not evil. I'm a good guy. Uh, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? That's what we need to be doing, is asking for the Holy Spirit. We need to be inviting the Holy Spirit to be in control of our lives. Because if we don't, then we're doing it in our own power. The more Holy Spirit we have, the better we will understand the Scriptures and we will understand the will of God. We will see something and say, that's unusual. What's going on? Oh, that's God working. And, and although it's not what I would have done, that's God working. Sometimes we look at things and say, oh, that's God. He's raising that man up to be president. Oh, we have to get behind him and stuff. And, and you know, sometimes I think, no, it's not. God doing that. It's just the people like the zealots that were trying to overthrow the Romans. It's people trying to do what they want to do. When we find the person that God is raising up, it'll be on our knees. That's where we find the person. His name is Jesus. I haven't seen him on any ballots. Is Jesus your king today? Have you witnessed the miracle of the Holy Spirit in your own lives? If not, today is the day of salvation. You see, we don't need to wait for a ceremony, a, a ritual. We don't need to, to wait for anything. Today is the day of salvation. If you've never invited Jesus Christ into your life, it's imperative. Because if you don't invite him into your life, you're not 
getting out of here and spending eternity with him. That's just what the scripture says. I may have paraphrased it a little bit, but it's the truth. We, every one of us, need to invite Jesus Christ into our lives. We need to ask him to forgive us of our sin. And then we need to repent. Every time Jesus cleansed someone, forgave them, healed them, he always said, go and sin no more. Now, he knew that it was going to be impossible for them to live without sin, but he still told them to do it. It should be our goal to live that way. We're not going to be perfect, but our, that's our goal. We're not going to be perfect until he perfects us. He will complete the work that he started in us. He will perfect us. And then, once again, he gets the glory for that too. He deserves all of it. If we invite him into our hearts, he will never leave us. He will never forsake us. I want to assure you that I don't believe that my way is the correct way. I don't believe that. I preach from the scriptures. That's the correct way. And I don't say this is the only way that, you know what? Read the scriptures yourself and then you decide what the Holy Spirit is saying. But if you come up with something that can be contradicted by another scripture, you're wrong. And I'll be happy to point that out for you because, you know, that's part of being a pastor. Part of being a pastor is saying, Pastor, I think this scripture is saying this. And, you know, if I agree, I'll say, yeah, praise the Lord, that, that is. But if it's not, and it's leading, I'll, I'll let you know. You know what? Uh, we have to look at all of scripture and we have to see how it all fits together and it all fits together. And then we come to the truth. You don't have to accept what I accept as the truth. But if you don't accept what the, the word of God says as the truth, then you're in trouble. And, and I can't save you. So you're just going to have to get over it. I know God's way is the correct way. And everyone who disagrees with him is wrong. Not with me, with him. Jesus isn't coming back to start a new religion. He's coming back to finish the work that he started. And we have all of the information that we need to see and prepare for him to come back. It's exciting. We're going through the book of Revelation. We're not going to be here for it. And that's the exciting part, is that you know, from chapter 4, verse 1 on, we're not here. And so we can be excited about the fact that we have a chance to make a difference today. So each of you, I pray, would make the difference today. Today is the day of salvation. And there's someone out there that needs to be saved. Amen?